right, everybody. Welcome to the Gilder Spotlight podcast. Today, I am super excited for our guest. It's Mike Spitalier. Uh, he is a multi-time founder, so entrepreneur, um, and currently just started his new venture called First Time Founder Capital. Uh, but Mike, if you can give a quick background of yourself to our audience, I'd love to kind of have you do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good to be here, Tyga. I appreciate it. Um, so I... I can go into deeper detail into each one of these uh, in a minute here, but started my first company in college, uh, kept that going for about three and a half years. The latter two, I was acting CEO. Um, as soon as we began dissolving that, uh, I started opening. I started working on my second startup, which was uh, in the physical spaces um, sector, which was definitely a big shift from a web CEO. Um, Ended up running into some issues with the license and excise board and city officials over in Denver. Uh, so we backburnered that, which sort of uh, came right up to the pandemic, um, was brought into an impact startup studio um, and built my third company in the food tech space focused on food waste and plastic waste. And then um, ended up doing some business development consulting right after that, uh, which led to about six months into that led into uh, a little bit of fundraising, coaching and consulting. And um, that sort of snowballed into first time founder capital today. Um, so aside from the businesses, you know, I've been uh, mentoring for Techstars, Founder Institute, Northeastern's Accelerator, Roo, um, and a handful of others throughout the way as well. Very cool, Mike. I kind of want to take a little step back to your college days. I know you started becoming an entrepreneur what initially got you into entrepreneurship? Because I know that's like fairly early. People are usually busy with the university, busy building, um, you know, finishing their thesis. What got you into entrepreneurship at that early age? Yeah, it's a good question. So I actually went to school for music. Um, so I was on the production side um, and ended up uh, meeting a couple of really close friends. And about six months before school ended, uh, one of our friends uh, told us about this idea he had and we started to dive into it a little bit and realized that there was some real legs to it. So we decided to pursue it a little bit. Um, you know, none of them had business backgrounds. And of course I did a bunch of business classes in high school and things mm -hmm. like that. So, um, I brought the sort of business mind to it. Uh, and we ended up, you know, pushing that along, um, building that and, and, and actually, uh, you know, creating a company from scratch, which was definitely not an easy feat for someone who didn't, uh, for four college students who had never founded a company before. Um, mm -hmm. I left school and moved to Austin to do a little bit of work on music. I um, was there during South by Southwest, which was phenomenal. Um, but about eight months into living there, I got a call from the CEO at the time, and he said that we gained some traction. We had some interest from some angels. So uh, we all moved up to Denver. Um, where he was placed. Uh, we all moved into his parents' house, which was a little Silicon Valley-esque, um, mm -hmm. but it was an incredible experience. So we we ended up uh, waking up every day and, and having a new fire to put out. Uh, we had to learn something new every single day. Um, you know, I was sort of the, the uh, outward face of the company. We were working with content creators, uh, and, you know, I, I spent most of my days either going to events to gather some interest in the Denver ecosystem or talking to musicians, uh, you know, action sports, athletes, filmmakers, things like that. Very cool. And what was the, what was the, uh, business that, that you started? So we were basically building, uh, it was a, a, a dual sided platform. Um, so it was a web company on the one side was a highly curated, uh, essentially a, a Vimeo or YouTube. So highly curated video. Um, and then on the other side was sort of our bread and butter. It was an all in one platform for content creators to make a living off of their passion. Um, haven't pitched this in a while, but, uh, it was, uh, you know, all the tools that they needed. Um, we were going to be building and editing tools and, um, whatever content creators use in order to, uh, you know, create and build and edit and finalize their, their products, um, mm -hmm. their content. And one of the coolest things on there that I was super excited about was the access to all the creatives across the globe. So once you signed up as a content creator, you got access to the platform and you got access to the whole network of creatives. So you're a uh, musician in Colorado, but you're flying out to Italy 
uh, and you need a filmmaker out there to help with a music video, um, mm -hmm. you just jump on that network and and uh, start reaching out to some of the filmmakers we had over there. Very cool. I love that. I I love that business. It, it's it's no. I mean, it's it's not surprising that you guys were able to find folks that are interested in investing it. Um, and kind of another step, taking us another step back, just what initially, why did you decide to get into music? Why did you, cause that's a, it's a really unique passion. My mom is also a musician. She played the piano. Were you, I'm assuming you're a musician kind of in your adolescence and then wanted to pursue it. And then you found kind of like entrepreneurship is like the kind of your main focus, but what, what got you into music originally? So actually I went to school for film for a year. Um, so I did uh, a bunch of film classes in high school, really fell in love with it. Uh, the, the sort of directing and video production side of things, uh, mm -hmm. went to school for a uh, film for a year, really was sort of disenchanted by it. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think, I uh, you know, I, I could go into a whole, um, tirade about that, but, uh, ended up meeting a couple friends there who showed me a whole new style of music. You know, I was uh, before that just sort of listening to the radio, whatever was on um, and didn't realize that there were, you know, so many different styles, so many different uh, artists, storytellers, things like that. So really fell in love with the music there. Ended up uh, taking a year off and, and uh, spent the year rock climbing around Northeast, uh, which was incredibly fun, but uh, dove deeper into music there and uh realized that it was something i wanted to pursue uh and and here we are today when i'm not working on music at all right very <laughs> very cool um and i also think just your background in in music and video probably were i mean two aspects that really helped this this video production business the social media um, production business that you first started um so after you moved to colorado you had that like kind of silicon valley living with a bunch of friends in their your parents place did anything kind of come into fruition after that because i'm assuming it says here that you know you've been you know in your early days you've been a ceo co-founder um you've been you know pretty much principal consultant you've talked with thousands of different startups so what would what did you do after um your entertainment business so we we sort of hit that classic um catch 22 with that business of uh you know we needed more funding in order to gain the traction that we wanted, but we wanted, we needed more traction, uh, to gain that funding. So, um, we decided we were young, you know, we wanted to work on other projects. So we decided to, to slowly dissolve it as that was happening. Uh, the license and excess board was passing a bill in Denver for the social consumption of cannabis. Um, not a user myself, but saw a huge business opportunity, you know, fell in love with coffee, of course, as an entrepreneur, um, drinking it consistently. Um, so I ended up working on opening up a cannabis friendly cafe out in Denver. Um, it was super interesting, you know, going from a web CEO to uh, physical spaces, you know, working with city officials, license, license and excise boards, designers, um, you know, sourcing coffee beans, um, real estate agents. It, it was a whole different game. Uh, mm -hmm. We ended up gathering a bunch of interest from investors, uh, didn't call any of that up, but got some commitments there, worked with some really incredible uh, consultants to get that up and running. Uh, but we sort of hit a, uh, a roadblock of not being able to find a space. Um, understandably, the, the rules and regulations around where we could set up shop were pretty strict. So we were, uh, you know, really trying to find a space that made sense for foot traffic, for location, but also for price. And we ended up, um, you know, not being able to secure a space uh, that was going to be a reasonable amount of profit per square footage. Um, mm -hmm. So we ended up backburnering that um, and then jumping straight over to the beginning of the pandemic um, the an impact startup studio in Denver. Um, was bringing together a bunch of entrepreneurs to build businesses uh, in industries that were hit hardest by the pandemic. So things like food and protective equipment for frontline workers, um, supply chain, things like that. Uh, you know, industries that were mucked up before, but uh, got hit really hard by COVID. So met my co-founder, uh, Jason, in that first day of the cohort. Uh, he had this idea of bringing some hardware and software into the food delivery arena which of course, as you know, was skyrocketing at the beginning of the pandemic, but uh, the food and plastic waste was skyrocketing alongside it. So we were working on bringing some 
technology into that space to try and cut into some of that food waste and, uh, you know, really help the restaurants, uh, bottom lines and the, uh, end user as well. Um, we ran into a bit of an issue a, a couple years into that, that I can't quite get into. Um, it was a, um, a co-founder dispute, not with Jason, but with our other co-founder. Um, mm -hmm. so we ended up having to, uh, tear that business down. We were about uh, two weeks away from hitting market, so that was a little bit difficult to to stomach there. Um, Jason told me to you know step away and and do a little bit of uh, consulting, just to keep my head above water, figure out what was next. Um, mm -hmm. So I did a little bit of business development consulting, um, you know, working with companies big and small uh, on things like new revenue stream assessments, sales strategy audits, go to market strategies, all that. And then about six months in, as I mentioned, I, I ran into a couple of, uh, you know, potential clients that were first time founders. And as I mm -hmm. was talking with them, I realized that they were making a lot of first time fundraising mistakes that I'd made in the past. I'd seen friends make in the past. Um, you know, one example being pre-product, they were uh, highly focused on raising 2 million at 20 valuation without any proof of concept, without any product in hand, without any customers. Um, and the market was already downturning. So I tried to, you know, have that conversation with them, but they wouldn't budge. Um, so those sort of things that, you know, second time, third time, fourth time founders are less rigid about. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did a little bit of, uh, you know, coaching and consulting, ended up connecting that first client to an investor from my past who closed that client's round, which sort of gave me that aha moment of realizing that, you know, a, a huge value add that I could bring would be to, uh, you know, help these founders get prepared for fundraising, but also have investors to introduce them to that are looking to invest in exactly what they're building. Uh, and that sort of uh, evolved into the uh, business that I'm building today, First Time Founder Capital. Very cool. Yeah. And it sounds like you have such an eclectic career going from kind of media entertainment to coffee and cannabis to now basically just consulting, connecting founders to, um, you know, different investors. And, um, it's super cool. Um, and also the, the food waste one, which is also really, really interesting. It's basically from, yeah, to sustainability. Um, what was kind of like the biggest, uh, you know, what was the biggest thing you learned from, you know, the, the food waste business to the, in the cannabis business? Cause it sounds like both those kind of dissolved that we're going to be successful but it was more difficult than you initially thought. I know that you had a founder dispute for your sustainable um, company, but what was it kind of like the biggest learning lesson that you learned from those two endeavors? That is a good question. Um, I suppose it's a little cheesy, but learning from failure, right. um, you know, each one of them, even the first startup, uh, you know, I, I like to say that I learned more in those three and a half years than I ever learned in, in all of my schooling combined. Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. extremely different reading about things and learning about things uh, than, you know, diving in head first and, and building the plane as you're flying it sort of mentality. Right. Right. Um, you know, you have to learn all of these different things or you're not going to survive. Right. It's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's very quick it's very fast moving and, and things change constantly. So being able to adapt and be agile um, and learn very, very quickly and learn a lot is a skill that all three of them really taught me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that one of the biggest takeaways from the uh, food tech business, which really correlates into first time founder capital was Jason was extremely brilliant. Uh, but he was very technically minded. So as he was building the hardware and software, uh, he let me wear every other hat. So I did all of our business strategy, um, all of the uh, you know business development, the financials, um, and all of our fundraising. So I ended up uh, you know really learning very heavily how to correctly fundraise, how to um, learn from the uh, many mistakes that I made um, prior to that and during that uh, experience. Um, and I really got to spend a lot of time talking to investors and really diving into the industry, which sort of sparked the deep interest that um, dove straight into first time founder. Very cool. Um, and I love the 
I mean, honestly, because I, I, I double major in environmental sustainability and business. So I really like the food waste, that food waste business. I feel like that was, that's perfect timing during the pandemic, just because I think people weren't eating out as much. They're ordering more food, but there's probably a lot of excess food as well. Um, are you, I mean, I know that you're doing first time founder capital. What are kind of like some of the, and I know you just recently started, but are there any kind of cool trends that you see in the industry right now that um, you think are, besides AI, obviously AI is like, you know, the most, like the, the biggest, the hottest trend in the past year and a half. But do you see any other trends from talking to thousands of startups um, consistently, like other than AI? Uh, industry trend. tre trends specifically? Trend. Yeah, industry trends. I think that uh, one that I find very cool is the deep tech arena. Um, very outside of my scope of competency, but, um, you know, some of these, uh, you know, natural disaster mitigation companies. Um, I was talking to this one that is uh, building a fire tech company to focus on forest fires, um, working with a company right now that is <clears throat> building hardware to map the seafloor. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the climate industry, of course, is, is continuing to see a huge influx of capital um, just because it's become very prevalent. Um, you know, the fires are getting worse. The hurricanes are, are brutal. Um, and the, the sort of infrastructure is being destroyed because of it. Tons and tons of money being spent uh, after the fact. So a lot of these investors are looking at climate tech companies. Um, and, and I think that some of them are, are just building some really incredible things. Yeah. No, I, I think that... Uh, with the climate tech. Yeah, I think another one that's that's really interesting to me, and and um, of course this this does have to do with AI, but uh, the the uh, mental health arena. Um, my parents are are my dad was a psychologist for thirty years. Uh, my mom runs an office of psychologists. Uh, my entire family is sort of surrounded by it. So um, seeing some of the the uh, technology being brought into that arena is is fascinating to me as well. And and I'm assuming that for psychologists, um, as as far as using AI, are are kind of like the end user, the end customer. Are they talking to AI about you know their specific you know things that they're going through, and then they it can kind of give them live feedback? Or what's kind of like the the thing that's kind of changing in in the in that in that industry in psychology um, with using that AI? That is the one that I've been seeing primarily. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, there's just a lot of technology that can be utilized in that space. Um, mm -hmm. you know, watching my parents do, uh, you know, the paper filing with the insurance companies and, um, it's a ton of backend work. So being able to bring technology in and, and help these people out, um, to run their businesses instead of, um, instead of focusing on the backend work, you know, actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and helping others. Very cool. And just another question. What was it like having two parents that are like, you know, psychologists? <laughs> I think you're the first person that I've ever talked to that both, both your parents are in, you know, mental health and psychology, which is super cool. It's been, I think, and also just kind of what I've noticed is it's been a, it's a, been a major shift probably since like 20, 2011, 2012, kind of when social media started becoming more bigger and prevalent in people's daily lives. It seems like mental well being has been such a, an important thing that, that we've been focusing on. So what was it like having, you know, parents as psychologists? Has has that helped you and your mental health and your mental well being? And and what do you also think of this this trend of of mental well being in the past, you know, 10, 15 years? I think it's fantastic. Um, as far as the trend goes, you know, I think that um there's been a lot more open discussion, uh, especially focused in entrepreneurship. Um, you know, how lonely, how difficult uh this road can be especially for solo founders. Um, so I think that being a lot more open about it is really incredible. Um, definitely mm -hmm. seeing a lot more opportunity for people to, um, you know, not keep all of that to themselves and struggle alone. Um, having my dad be a psychologist has, has certainly been very helpful um, throughout the years. Uh, I don't think I appreciated it as much when I was a teenager, but um, certainly taught a lot about, you know, emotional resilience and things along those lines. Uh, my oldest sister's a psychologist, my second oldest is a nurse practitioner. Um, and my, my, uh, 
my youngest sister runs my mom's office. So the entire family is really uh, ingrained in that that industry. And health and well-being. So it's like you, you're basically the one that got into music and entrepreneurship, but the rest of your family is in health and well-being, which is really, really cool. Um, yeah, and, and just kind of going off the... Because I know like being a founder is a really lonely world. What are kind of things that you've been doing yourself um, to help, you know, I mean, as mentioned before, being a founder is a lonely world. What do you do to help yourself kind of get that clarity to work, keep that consistent energy, get through that tough grit, working those late nights, early hours? Um, what are kind of things that you recommend to those entrepreneurs that are kind of facing that that tough, tough you know, endeavor of just being a founder? I think you have to surround yourself with people that understand what you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I could speak with a bunch of friends about the struggles of the day to day, you know, the, the lack of motivation, the, um, the constant no's, uh, you know, it, it can be very difficult. Um, but talking with a bunch of friends who are, you know, not in this world isn't as um, fulfilling or, or, um, sort of emotionally releasing is talking with someone that really understands because they're in it as well. Um, I have this really great friend who is running a business himself. He's been in the startup and investing game for a little while. Uh, so every time one of us is, is feeling that lack of motivation where we're feeling a little down or feeling a little out, um, we give each other a call and, and talk through it. And I think that that has been a, a saving grace. So if you are a solopreneur, uh, it, you need to really find your group of people, whether that be, you know, a mastermind group or, um, you know, some sort of uh, community where you can really speak about the troubles that you're dealing with, um, because a lot of people won't understand and that that won't help your cause very much. Yeah, I couldn't echo that more. It's um, another kind of thing that can relate to, like, you know, entrepreneurship and people not really understanding your day to day is I know a lot of people study abroad, they have kind of culture shock and they come back and they can't relate to anybody um, when they get back. Um, so it's, it's yeah, it's it, being able to talk to people that have worn your shoes, that have worn as many hats as you, being a founder um, is, is critical. Um, going back to um, your, last in, your last couple endeavors where you would have a technical partner and you're basically doing all the business aspects. You're wearing 10 different hats, you're fundraising. How did you map out your day and how did you map out like your productivity so you can maximize pretty much every single hour? Like what were, were there things that you were doing different or do you have a specific morning routine? Um, how, did you, how did you maximize your day wearing all those different hats? Uh, very different from my day to day today. Um, and I can dive into that in a minute here, but um, you know, it was, it was pretty scattered, um, you know, as, as you could probably imagine, uh, you know, you can have blocks of the day blocked off, um, for specific tasks, but if you get in touch with a potential partner or a potential investor, um, you know, your calendar is, is completely open to them, right? So mm -hmm. things get moved around pretty constantly. Uh, you know, I, I just kept a, um, I kept a close eye on the tasks that I needed to do for the week. Um, mm -hmm. You know, started the started Sundays with um, you know a deep understanding, trying to figure out exactly what the tasks were for the week, what the most important ones were, um, which ones, if I didn't accomplish, wouldn't be detrimental, um, and really just start knocking them out throughout the week. Um, so. Admittedly, it was, uh, you know, 60, 80 hour weeks in my last startup. Um, it definitely wasn't as uh, I wasn't as diligent about um, being ultra productive as possible. Um, you know, mapping out my day, blocking out my days. Uh, it was a lot more of, um, you know, understanding what I needed to do and just getting it done. Got it. And then how is your I know you said that it's a lot different now with, with what you're doing at First Time Founder Capital. What's like the average, what, how do you, how do you map up, map out your time now? So something that I did right after my last startup working, you know, two, two years of 80 hour weeks, um, was shift my Calendly so that I start meetings at 1130, which is okay. very different. Um, 
So my girlfriend's a teacher. I wake up with her uh, at 630 in the morning, um, which was terrible in the beginning, but I got used to it. Uh, and so I have that block from 630 to 1130 to um, I typically wake up, I, I make some coffee, I read for about an hour, uh, practice a little French, you know, go for a run or, or work out, um, get a little bit of work done before the meetings start and jump into the meetings and, and typically have, you know, meetings sporadically throughout the day ends at four o'clock and um, I can get the, the uh, you know, tasks and to do's done after that as well. Um, so very big shift from waking up at uh, seven and, and immediately getting to work. Yeah, no, I, I love, actually, I love that. I think going out, going on a jog, eating good breakfast, you know, basically, um, you know, strengthening parts of your brain that you typically don't like learning French um, is a lot better, especially when you're in, in a customer facing position, like starting your meetings at 11, I think, than just waking up, taking a shower and then just going into it. Because I think sometimes I find myself being lethargic or just not feeling right. And I, I love that how you know you know, start your day out with all the right things pretty much um which is super cool um but what and another thing too um i know that another thing that you in your kind of your bio it says that you're always you know evolving in this ever-evolving business landscape how do you keep up with all the industry trends because i'm sure you're industry agnostic with the founders that you work with and the founders that you find investors for how do you keep up with all these trends? Because it's such an ever-changing, you know, world. Literally, like we've been. I mean, every single month it seems like something's changing, something's updating. Um, so, how do you keep up with it all? I've been, uh, you know, I've positioned myself in a very uh, fantastic spot here because I talk with a bunch of founders throughout the week um, in all different industries. Uh, you are right; I am industry agnostic, but I don't work with pharma or biotech or medical device just because it's a completely different fundraising structure um, not my core competency whatsoever um, but being able to speak with a bunch of founders about what they're building uh, really helps shape the uh, the understanding from the founder side but sort of uniquely I also get to speak with investors all week um, so what are they what are they looking at what's interesting to them? Um, you know, asking them a bunch of questions, being able to look at both sides and have those conversations uh, with both founders and investors is a very quick way to keep up with things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, time to do a, a ton of individual research while I'm able to, uh, you know, speak with all these people about the trends they're seeing, um, what they're looking to invest in. Uh, what the the uh, you know the goal markers are for pre seed and seed and Series A and all of those. Got it. And I'm assuming most of the most of your clients you're working with are they filling their early stage rounds like their pre seed seed rounds or are they more kind of like Series A, Series B, Series D? Um, so I work with uh, pre seed to Series A. Um, okay. Once they're once they're at Series B, they they sort of have everything locked down. Um, they typically have people. Uh, internally that that focus on the things that I, I provide these early stage founders. So yeah, to uh, precede to Series A. Very cool. And I, I hear that actually kind of echoing what you're saying. It's the most difficult time for a startup to raise is are those like precede to seed rounds. After it's like a series, series A and above or Series B, you know, the investor ecosystem is kind of talking about, you know, this cool hot startup to invest in and, and just going through word of mouth. So how do you, or what would you recommend for those founders that are looking to fundraise those early stage fundraising rounds that have never done it before? What would you recommend? Uh, come talk to me. Um, I, well, I do want to mention bio and all that stuff too, for sure. Um. <laughs> I do. I do want to mention that uh, you know I, I I by no means am saying that uh, once you hit Series B and beyond, it's it's easy. Um, it definitely has its own struggles. Um, it can be extremely difficult, especially now where, um, you know, later stages is, is drying up quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the reason I named it the, the firm first time founder capital, um, is really because, you know, there's so much that goes into the fundraising process. Um, it's extremely complex and, and tacking that onto 
being a first time founder and trying to run a business and get yourself to a point where you are investable, attractive to investors is a lot to deal with. Um, and you know, this, this common mentality that a founder needs to basically take a step back and, and run the fundraising process as a 40 hour, uh, job, um, is a bit ludicrous to me. You know, I, I don't think that the CEO should be taking their eye off the ball. Um, and I think that if you're stalling traction, then, uh, your investor updates are going to be quite bland and boring and, and not going to hook anyone. Um, so I'm coming into this with the mentality of, you know, working with a founder, I, I, uh, you know, I bring the ability to help them very easily, um, sort of sharpshoot exactly what they need to get done in order to get everything built in order to have all those necessary building blocks to be investable without taking mm -hmm. up a ton of their time, doing a bunch of research and building all these things themselves. And, um, you know, trying to come in and be, uh, trying to come in and help them not make this a 40 hour job, um, mm -hmm. try and help them build everything with, with, uh, very concisely and very quickly, um, but still high quality while they're continuing to build their business. I love that. So you're ultimately saving, you know, the C-suite, the CEO, a lot of time on, on their fundraising endeavors. What does your typical process look like? So you, I'm assuming you probably... I'm assuming you probably don't work with every single person that, that crosses your desk. Do you, do you kind of look at the ones that are actually going to be investable or do you have like an interview process? You look at their data room or like, all right, like this seems like something that could get traction. What's your process look like? So definitely don't work with every founder I, I come across. Um, mm -hmm. you know, something that I have to be careful of and, and cognizant of is my reputation. Um, so you know, if I start sending these investors in my investor network a ton of deals that really weren't um, assessed, then they're going to stop opening my emails, right? So my reputation is going to be tarnished and and there goes that, uh, you know, huge value add from first time founder capital. So when I speak with the founder, you know, I, I really dive into exactly what they're building, um, let them tell their story uh, and talk to me about the market size. Um, where they're at, what their traction looks like. And then I do a little bit of digging afterwards to understand what their competition looks like, you know, what the market size really is, um, what the sort of viability is uh, within the current landscape. If I have investors in the space, what those investors are saying, what they're looking for. Um, and if it is something that, you know, I'm interested in, I, I really like the company. I like the founder. I think that they have a huge opportunity uh, I bring them in. If they, uh, you know, sign on as a client, we start off by determining what their starting line is. Um, what do they have built? Uh, where? What's the health of their business? Um, and what's the health of the sort of fundraising foundation? So do you have your pitch deck? Do you have your financials? Do you have your pitch down? Do you have your data room? Um, mm -hmm. What does your competitive analysis look like? Uh, you know, all these sort of necessary pieces that a founder needs to have in place in order for an investor to see that they're prepared. Um, and then we dive through it. You know, I help them wherever they need help, um, clear, cleaning up the pitch deck, uh, building their data room if they're they're a little earlier on, um, you know, helping with the financials, walking them through, uh, you know, all these different aspects on the, the sort of coaching side. Um, we build an ideal investor list together so I can understand who they're targeting, why they're targeting them. And then I start reaching out to those investors um, to try and bring them into the network. So it switches from a cold outreach to a warm outreach, um, very curated outreach. And uh, we continue building together until their foundation is is solid. Um, their mm -hmm. strategy is solid. They know how much they're raising. Um, they know who they're, they'd like to raise from. Um, and they're prepared to answer all these questions about their business. Their narrative is built, all of that. And then once we are solid there, then I start to actively shop the deal around. So you know, that that sort of looks like, uh, you know, let's say you're a B2B SaaS founder. Um, of course, there are a bunch of B2B SaaS investors in the network. Um, so we build uh, a little packet to send to them uh, that's very specific. I built that with some of my earliest investors to make sure it's exactly what they're looking to see um, in, a, a, in a deal email. Um, and then I start sending those off to the investors and, and, uh, you know, making the intros to the founder if, if, and when the investors are interested. 
Very cool. And and I'm assuming you also do help them prep to talk to him, the investor. You kind of do like founder hot seats where you're you're mocking as you're in, as an investor. So then they go into the meeting and they feel comfortable and confident that they can talk the similar lingo that investors do. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's uh, you know on the similar vein of of reputation there. You know if I if I send a company and they're interesting, but they're not prepared, uh, you know, they don't have a data room set up. They, they aren't ready to answer these questions. Um, you know, it's, it's a continuation of my reputation, right? I'm sending this deal along, um, until the close of the check. Um, it's still seen as a deal that I send along to the investor. So my name is still tacked onto it. Um, so I try and make sure that these founders are prepared for, um, all of these conversations and have everything in place so that, uh, you know, they're not making an investor wait for anything specifically. Got it. Yeah. I, I love what you're doing. Um, and I'll also make sure that I have, you know, first time capital, I'll have, you know, your product information, um, in the Lincoln bio, cause I love what you're doing. And I think it's, it's, you know, a necessity for founders to have, you know, a service like yours in order to succeed. Um, you know, a couple last things, what is, you know, one, one thing of advice that you would tell to founders um, that are just starting out? And I know I've kind of asked this question like for, for investing and fundraising advice, but just um, just general advice, um, what, would you, which, what would you tell an entrepreneur first starting out? Um, it's a lot more difficult than it seems from the outside. Um, you know, it's, uh, there are a lot of moving pieces and I think that it's very important at, on the fundraising side to understand where your company is and where investors are looking to invest at that certain stage. Um, you know, there are specific parameters for each stage that you want to reach in order to, you know, hit the goals of the investors in that stage. Um, mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're not, you know, going to raise the wrong round or raise an astronomical amount. Um, and make sure that you have the, the right traction metrics, things along those lines. Um, because I think that, you know, if you're a first time founder, especially, and you try and go out on the fundraising trail and, and you're just far too early, um, and you don't have things in place, your narrative isn't built very well. Um, you know, you're not speaking to the gold nuggets of your business, then you're going to hear a lot of no's and that can be extremely difficult, um, and really crush into the resolve of the founder. Uh, so really understand where you're at and what you're trying to build and where you're trying to go and understand exactly what you need to have in place in order to be investable or else you're just going to, you know, keep taking those hits, keep taking those nose, those punches to the face. Um, and that can be really difficult. Awesome. And then one last question, Mike because you started kind of your entrepreneurial endeavors when you're in college, you moved to Colorado. What would you tell your early 20 year old self who moved to Colorado with a bunch of your friends? What, what piece of advice or what, what thing would you tell, tell your you know younger self? Ooh, lots of things. Um, okay. I would, you know, there are lots of business things I would tell them. Um, but, at the same time, I think that, you know, being in those terrible situations, being in those situations where I, I failed or I had to, um, you know, put out a, a big fire were incredible learning experiences. So I, I certainly wouldn't want to, um, you know, just pass along that lesson without experiencing it. Um, so it's tough to say. I, I would say uh, go skiing more. Um, I'm back in the East Coast and the, the skiing is certainly not as good. So um, take more time to go skiing while you're building those businesses, uh, mm -hmm. and really enjoy the moment, right? It's, uh, it's the classic adage of, uh, those were the best days of our lives, whatever it is. Um, you know, the, those certainly were some truly incredible days, uh, you know, learning to be an entrepreneur, uh, going to five to seven events a week, um, skiing with friends while taking business meetings on the side of the mountain. Um, you know, just a, an incredible experience overall. Well, Mike, fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for being a guest. If you ever want to come to Montana, that's where I'm typically based half the time. We got to go skiing sometime. Absolutely. 
I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I did just want to mention one thing before we go. Uh, I It will probably be in the show notes, I imagine. Yeah. Um, I took all of the templates, tools, and resources that I use with founders to help them get from zero to one in fundraising prep uh, very quickly without them having to build anything themselves and pulled it into a product um, that I released very recently. Um, so head over to that uh, link and and uh, give it a look over and let me know. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. Um, but uh, yeah, happy to happy to chat with any founder out there. Awesome. That sounds fantastic, Michael. Put it in the show notes. I really appreciate your time and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you. You as well. Awesome. Cheers.